All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started today. Um, so I heard the uh, the phase change assignment from yesterday was kind of tricky, right? Or at least the first problem was. The first problem is kind of tricky. We're going to talk about that's mainly what we're going to be focused on today. And then we're going to finish up. I think we'll be able to finish up most of the phase change, phase diagram stuff. Um, and then that leaves us just one chapter, which is nuclear chemistry um, that we should be able to start on Friday. So we're getting into some stuff that we've been leading up to for a long time. Um, but uh, and and closing in on the on the end of the term, which is kind of fun, right? Y'all put in a lot of hard work this year. So now it's time to enjoy it. We get to ease up a little bit on the assignments since we've done, we've made a lot of good progress and uh, and it's paying off now. Uh, so a couple, couple more random questions before we get into um, the uh, assignment from yesterday and tomorrow. Um, why can't humans adapt to change in pressure instantly? We've talked a lot about how when, when you're scuba diving, going up and down, um, changing pressure, going just from, you know, from sea level up to our altitude can mess with your, mess with your head, mess with your uh, equilibrium, give you vertigo, give you altitude sickness. Why is it, why can't we just adapt instantly? Um, and mainly that's because uh, we have one of the ways that our body regulates pressure internally is we have sort of the air pockets in our body for various, various reasons, partly just to be able to, um, to be, be able to adapt a little bit like having, is that a good analogy? Um, a little bit like having shocks on a car. If you have, if you have nothing in your body, but liquids, then your body can't really adjust to changes in pressure. It's kind of got a constant pressure and a constant volume. Um, but that also means if there's slight fluctuations in the atmospheric pressure, your body won't handle that very well. Um, however, if you have these little pockets of gas in your body, that basically allows them to sort of get compressed or expand as the outside pressure changes and respond so that we maintain a more or less constant um, force relative to the outside pressure. But the thing about those pockets of gas is they also have to adjust. So if anybody's ever gone scuba diving or just dive down to the bottom of a deep pool, um, you know, your sinuses, um, your ears, um, your lungs, to some extent, all anything that has like an air pocket to it, your lungs are designed to constantly be moving in and out and exchanging and stay at constant pressure inside your lungs. But there are other air pockets in your, in your abdomen as well. Uh, for various reasons and those you have to give ch time to adjust and basically as long as you're consistently breathing in and out that um your those air pockets in your body will eventually adjust to whatever that exterior pressure is because that's part of the function of your lungs is your lungs are working against the outside pressure but allowing those other air pockets to adjust um but it does take time and there are some ways that you can speed things up, you know, by, you know, sort of if you massage underneath your ears, if you blow in, if you're going the right direction, you can blow into your nose with it plugged. Um, that really only works going one direction. You go, if you're going down underwater or down towards, uh, down in an airplane, then you're in, you have not enough air pressure in your ears and in your sinuses. And if you do that, if you then at basically force air into your sinuses and into your ears by plugging your nose and blowing through your nose, you can basically force the air in and get it to be closer to the outside pressure and relieve things. If you try to do that when you're going up, you're actually making it worse and you can blow out your eardrums doing that. So when you're going upward, don't plug your nose and blow um, because that's going to only make things worse it can have a, a net positive effect a little bit because you can kind of sort of like break a break the seal a little bit and then allow it to go the other way but you also can blow out your eardrums doing that
potentially, I guess. I've never heard of that before, but it could potentially work. Um, you'd be drawing the air from your sinuses and your ears into your lungs. Um, we definitely wouldn't recommend doing that with a sinus infection. Um, but in theory, I wouldn't recommend going scuba diving with a sinus infection at all. So it still helps just the same way that moving your jaw helps, chewing gum helps, that kind of thing, just by moving your your face that kind of can break that seal and allow it to slowly equalize but it's just not something the humans are well adapted for because it's not being able to instantly equalize your ears has never been an evolutionary advantage there's never been any situation in human history where it's it's to your advantage for your survival that you're able to equalize your ears right for most of human history humans have not had air travel or scuba diving um so there's not really, a, it was never really a need. There's never really an evolutionary, um, what's the term? Uh, driver, an evolutionary driver towards being able to equalize your ears being a positive thing. Um, so the fact we can do it at all is actually kind of impressive. Um, but anyway, and then last but not least, when inhaling helium gas, why does your voice change? We actually talked about this. We talked about how different gases move at different speeds, right? Even at the same temperature, a lighter gas will be moving faster, right? And so when you, if you have helium in your lungs and you breathe out and, tr and use that gas to vibrate um, your vocal cords, they vibrate faster because the helium atoms are moving faster. The same way that, that um, blowing harder into, into a trumpet can change the, the note you can go from one octave, go up to a different note by blowing harder, by blowing, moving the air faster. By putting helium through your vocal cords, you're actually able to make your vocal cords vibrate faster, which changes what you sound like. Kind of interesting. Um, and in theory, hydrogen would be even better. And there actually was, I remember seeing a news story in like the mid 2000s about there was a brand of beer in Japan that they carbonated with hydrogen gas instead of CO2, um, specifically so that you could sing karaoke better. Um, you could basically like inhale a bunch of the, a bunch of the, uh, the foam from your beer and be able to hit that high note. I don't remember if that was just a fact, if that's still a thing, but I do remember seeing a headline about that in the, in the early 2000s. All right, let's jump forward. This is the same slide deck from, from last Wednesday at this point. Um, we're still just working our way through it. I just didn't trim it down. Uh, we talked a little bit about delta H effusion, delta H vaporization. Um, All right, so let's talk. Let's talk about the um, the vapor pressure problem on the homework first. Then we'll talk about phase changes a little bit more, or energy of phase changes a little bit more. So, skipping um, forward here. So this equation is a really complicated looking equation, but it comes from something we've talked about before which is just this idea that equilibrium constant is equal to E to the minus delta G over RT. Well, delta G is a, form, is a type of energy, a way of measuring, it's actually a way of measuring the change in entropy of the universe. Um, but it has two terms associated with it. Delta G is defined as, um, so delta G equals delta H minus temperature times delta S. Well, delta H we've talked about a little bit. That's the energy in the chemical bonds, right? Delta S is entropy, which we haven't done much with in terms, we've talked about it as a general concept, but we haven't really done any math with it yet. Um, and we're going to continue to not do much math with that. Um, I'm showing you this mainly so that we can, I can show you where this equation comes from and do this derivation. If you take these two terms and substitute them in here, 
we get the equilibrium constant is equal to E to the minus delta H minus T delta S all over RT, which we can actually do some, um, some algebra with this. If we separate this out, we can get K equals E to the minus delta H over R T times E to the delta S over R. If we just separate these two terms and then use law of logs to take this and distribute this negative sign. Um, we can turn this into a multiplication. This term right here, we can't really do a whole lot. That's gonna be more or less a constant for, a for every reaction. But this term here has a temperature term built into it. And also remember that for these equilibrium, uh, for these uh, vapor pressures, so remember vapor pressure is basically going to be the equilibrium process for a liquid going to a gas. Right, does that sound familiar? What is the equilibrium expression for this process? K equals what? Or if I specifically, if I say KP for this reaction, it's just what? Just, did you say one or water? Just water. Which means we can say that the vapor pressure for this react for any any reaction is going to be based on the temperature, but also delta H vaporization for that liquid. Whatever delta H vaporization is is going to affect um, your vapor pressure at a given temperature. So if I just substitute in vapor pressure. We get this combined equation, which if we're trying to not deal with exponents here, one of the ways we can adjust this is we can take this and we can just take the natural log of both sides. And if we do that, we get natural log of vapor pressure is equal to, so if you take natural log of this, you're going to get minus delta H over RT. And then that's going to be plus delta S over R. We're getting somewhere. Temperature is the variable we're interested in here, right? The rest of this is going to be a constant. Delta H is a constant, more or less, for every for every um, for every substance. Delta S is going to be a constant based on on the reaction, R is a constant. The only real variable here is temperature. So we take this, if we just separate that out, we can get natural log of vapor pressure equals minus delta H over R times one over T plus a constant. We're just gonna call that a constant. That's what this reaction comes from. It's basically just from our definition of an equilibrium constant. And the fact that vapor pre evaporation is this simple process, is this simple process where we can then take vapor pressure and plug it in for K. So what does this actually get us? Well, what we get out of this is we get the form of an equation that actually will give us a straight line. So just like with our gas laws lab where we plotted pressure versus one over volume, like well, one over volume doesn't really mean anything but it's what allows us to get a straight line and then get an equation for a line, right? This is the same thing, just in a more complicated uh, function. What this is going to allow us to do is if you take raw data of vapor pressure at different temperatures, if you plot natural log of your vapor pressure on the y-axis and you plot one over T on the x-axis, And it's y equals mx plus b. We'll stick to using that form. We get a straight line. So 
problem on the on the homework assignment said, okay, it gave you a bunch of data, right? It said, here's a bunch of temperatures, here's the vapor pressure at that temperature. What is delta H of vaporization? That's an Excel problem. If you have the if you have a spreadsheet, you take this and you plot, plug in your temperature and plug in your pressure. And technically, it doesn't even matter what units your pressure's in as long as we're consistent. Um, but it might as well be an atmosphere since we do have an R here. This R is more going to be associated with with uh, joules. Uh, but as long as you're consistent with your vapor pressure, it shouldn't matter. It'll adjust. It'll um, adjust whether your uh, what your intercept is, but it shouldn't matter as far as figuring out your slope. What's the delta S again? So delta S is the change in entropy for the reaction, um, and that's why for this for this class, it a lot of times just gets rewritten as just plus C. It's just the intercept. It doesn't it doesn't really have anything we're going to do. We're going to use this term for, and delta S does change with temperature to some extent. Um, so a lot of times we'll just call this a constant and not, but it comes from that original definition of delta G. And so, but the main thing that we get out of this is if we know the equation for this line, the slope tells us delta H of vaporization. And not only that, it allows us to predict um, the vapor pressure at different temperatures, right? So this problem on the board here says, use the data to determine the heat of vaporization of the normal boiling point of ammonia. Well, if we know the slope of the line, that gives us, the slope of the line is, minus delta H over R. So just getting the equation for the line is enough to answer the first part of this, which I say that like it's an easy thing to do. It takes a little bit of, of review, perhaps. To summarize, you would graph temperature on the x-axis and pressure would be on the y? One over temperature on the x-axis and natural log of vapor pressure on the y. And that's the trick part to it, right? So you start from the raw data, and then you make, and I'll, I'll walk us through this problem here. So that's what you plug into Excel, right? You put everything over. Plug, over yeah, exactly. And is this the same, are these the same numbers as the, as the practice problem? Okay. Um, so you'll be able to, I'll walk you through it with the same numbers. So you'll be able to look at, at this and get, um, and be able to check your answer. But I still want you to, to do the math on your own. I'm gonna mess with the sig figs a little bit here. Um, so it'll still give us something roughly linear, but it won't be the exact same number that you should get. Uh, but I'll walk you through the process for doing this here. Um, so I guess, let's start with that. Let me pull up. All right, and well, I'm just going to input my data when it's on the other screen. Oh. oh. All right. Temperature, Kelvin, and P in four. So Six. 
All right, so if we've got our temperature in Kelvin and our vapor pressure in torque. If we want to plot these things, we want to plot one over temperature, we're just going to make Find out. There we go. Just make another column that's one over temperature. Literally, just going to be equals one over temperature. Got it. Needs to be in Kelvin, or this doesn't work, though. Copy and paste the formula. We get a bunch of numbers. Doesn't matter what they are for now. Then for vapor pressure. Ln of vapor pressure equals Ln, open parentheses, select your vapor pressure, enter, copy and paste. So, and then when it comes time to inserting the chart, remember to get you, we don't want sheets the thing for us, so put your cursor away from everything else. And we're just gonna go through and add your x-axis, which I'm not used to. Move the chart to its own sheet. Edit the chart. So select your data range. We want our X's to be the one over temperature. We want the Y's to be data range is going to be next to that. Here's another case of it's trying to think for us. We don't really want that. Get rid of whatever's in there already. Put your natural loss. And whatever reason, it's not liking. That should be. Ah, uh, that's because it's gave me the wrong type of chart. Um, well, it does look kind of like a. There we go. There, that looks fairly linear, right? And then we want to add a. Um, down here, there's an option to add a trend line. Yeah, there it is. You can tell I'm not used to sheets. Seven series. And then we also want to show the R squared. We want to make the label. Is that a custom? Well, is that a custom? There it is. Got a pretty good R squared value. Got a decent equation here. Um, so if we want to, now that we have the equation, all we're going to do is our slope is 3,670. So negative 3,670. If that's our slope, finding delta H is as simple as Multiply both sides by by negative r. Which value of r do we have to use for this, though? What type of units should delta h be in? What is delta h? We doing this without remembering what the variable act we're solving for actually means. We don't want that. 
What is delta H? It's the energy in the bonds, right? The key word is energy, which means what types of units should delta H be in? Joules. Joules per mole. And so we want to use the value of R that has joules involved. So there's one of the values of R that's on your equation sheet is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And the slope though is not gonna have that, that Kelvin is gonna wind up getting used up because we've got, um, we were multiplying by one over temperature. So basically we're gonna multiply both sides by 8.314 joules per mole. So 3,670 times 8.314. And I didn't change the numbers that much. So this should be pretty close to the number you get. 8.314 times 3,670. I get 3.05 times 10 to the four joules per mole. Or 30.5 kilojoules per mole. When we're dealing with these enthalpies, a lot of times kilojoules work out better than joules do. So a lot of times we'll switch to kilojoules. And we got that just by plotting the data, getting the slope of the line. All right, for the other part of the problem. So let me write down the equation here. Y equals negative 3,670. X plus 22, 22.1. Emily, what does that say right there? I can't see it. Thank you. If we want to know the regular boiling point of ammonia, all we have to do is we're going to be solving for what? What does regular boiling point of ammonia mean? How would we report that? What units would we put it in? Temperature units, right? We can't solve for temperature directly because we don't have temperature. X is what? Is one over temperature. And Y is natural log of vapor pressure. What are we going to plug in for the pressure? If we want the, the normal boiling point, one ATM, or since we did everything in TOR, we want to plug in 760. Solve for T. All right, so I'm not going to work through the rest of that right now, but I do want to let's double check whether our uh, we can use just any vapor pressure or units if we're consistent, or if, does it have to be in atmospheres? Right? If we convert each of these tors into atmospheres, then we should get the same slope of the line, and we should be able to then plug in natural log of one, which would be zero, in order to get our normal boiling point. So if we... equals this over 760. 
that's going to give us our vapor pressure and torque. And then instead of having this look at the torque, we take natural log of this column instead. notice that the slope is the same. Slope is still negative 3670, but the intercept changed. So because the laws of logs is kind of what allows us to use whatever units we want as long as we're consistent. Um, probably the most common way though would be to do everything in atmospheres. But as long as we're consistent, it shouldn't really matter. We should still get the same value for temperature when we solve for it either way, All right? And so I'm not gonna solve, go all the way through this one um, because once you get here, it's just some algebra, right? And I think everybody can do algebra at this point. Anybody have any questions about the Excel side? Now that you know it's an Excel problem and what the, that equation means, it shouldn't be too tricky. It's still a little bit weird and abstract. I think I've talked to you guys before about how I, when I see the first time I saw an equation like this, it felt like cheating. You mean I can just take whatever function I want and rearrange it to make it look linear and get a straight line? Um, but mathematically, we're not breaking any rules to do this. Taj? Yeah. Natural log, that's function, right? There's P vape is our vapor pressure. So we're taking the natural log of our vapor pressure. Our slope, this term is negative delta H. That's, that delta H is that enthalpy, is the energy in the chemical bonds. And so when we're breaking those chemical bonds apart, we have to put energy in to get it to evaporate because we're breaking all those intermolecular forces, right? That energy is delta H. R is just our ideal gas constant but not in, in liters and atmospheres, double check your conversion sheet and you'll see that there's two values, one that's in energy units and one that's in liters and atmospheres. And in this case, because we're using it to cancel out units um, for delta H, we wanna make sure we're using the energy units, which is this value, 8.314 joules per mole. One over temperature, that's just, Literally, just take your temperature, do one divided by your temperature in Kelvin, gives you this number here. And this term here, we're not doing very much with for right now. It's our intercept that we get on our line. It does have a physical meaning, but we're not going to do much with entropy. At delta S is the entropy of this process. Um, and R is still the same R value, but we're not really using that in this case because we're, it's beyond the scope of this class. So just treat it, it's just the intercept. Um, and don't read too much more into it beyond that. Okay? Delta H. So enthalpy, that's enthalpy. With the e, it's E-N-T-H-A-L-P-Y. It's basically the energy of the reaction. Um, it's the energy, if you have a change in enthalpy, it means that you're changing the amount of energy in the chemical bonds or in the intermolecular forces. So in the case of a liquid turning to a gas, in order to do that, you have to take all those, those attractive intermolecular forces and split them apart. You have to break all those attractive forces between the water molecules the energy that you have to put in to do that is delta H. The energy that you have to add in this case for the reaction to happen. If the reaction was going backwards, it'd be the energy that you got, that you get when these things stick together, it's gonna to give off energy to the surroundings. That amount of the energy is delta H, is the change in enthalpy for the system. Does everybody feel like you could at least get started on this problem and start to muddle your way through it? If, if you're working in small groups, this is this is this week's lab. 
um, is is actually doing the Excel, doing the spreadsheets. So bring bring a, a, a Chromebook or a laptop tomorrow so you can work. I want everybody to have their own spreadsheet. I don't want you just writing down the, the equation from the people you're working with. Practice typing it all in yourself um, and even and submit it with the assignment too. When you submit your assignment, I want everybody to submit their own self, their own spreadsheet with it too. Scott? So the piece of paper is Exactly. Delta H. The other word for enthalpy is heat. The heat of vaporization is delta H of vaporization. Seems like kind of a leap to go from just this all the way to delta H vaporization, all the way to predicting the, the um, boiling point. But you have all the tools. And I know it feels a little conceptually like I'm dropping into the deep end here, but give it time, let, let the ideas sort of marinate and just know that this equation, it's called, this is all um, also called the clausius clapeyron equation. Um, this equation works. A lot of the, the derivation, where it all comes from, what all the variables mean, um, is in, you know, it's important stuff, but it's something that you'd spend more time with as you get further and further into, into chemistry or physics. Um, so for now, knowing the mechanics for if I have this data, here's how I plug it in and here's how I get a value that makes sense and that it has some use to it. Here's how I can use it to predict the vapor pressure at a different temperature. Um, understanding that process is really what we're going for right now. The understanding comes the more times you see it and the more we develop this background, the more we talk about the idea of what entropy is, some of this will start to make more sense. Anything else I wanted to talk Yeah, I think that's that's about as in-depth as I want to get at this point. I don't want to spend too much time on the entropy side of things because that's a whole different beast. All right, any more questions on this problem? Remember, the assignment's not due until next Tuesday, I think. So you'll have another two more times that you're going to see me that you can ask questions. And you can always ask questions during the lecture, at the beginning of lecture. Hey, can we go over how you did that again? Or hey, and you know, ask ask Mr. Thomas too um, during during class tomorrow. All right. So there's a few sort of vocab ideas that we're going to talk about when it comes to liquid. The way that, way that we kind of describe liquids, um, and most of these are going to be based on intermolecular forces. More intermolecular forces or different types of intermolecular forces are going to give you different macroscopic properties for liquids. Um, and some of them are a little bit weird, though, because, I mean, how else, how would you describe the difference between say maple syrup and ocean water, right? We can't really use that in a uh, quali quantitative way though, right? How do we quantify the taste of salt or sweet? We can find concentrations of sugar versus sodium chloride, right? Um, what else is different about, how could you tell the difference between the two without tasting them? Color. What about corn syrup if it's colorless? The thickness, what's different about those two is a lot of the time it's going to be based on those intermolecular forces. And that's one of those properties. It's called viscosity. So you've probably heard of the term, the term, if not the term viscosity, you've heard some of liquid described as being viscous. Viscous just means how thick it is, how well it flows. Um, 
And it's a weird thing to actually put a quantifiable unit to, but uh, let it never be said that physicists lack for creativity because there is a way to mathematically define and quantify how viscous a liquid is. Um, and it's not based on density. Seems like the more the, the more dense a liquid is, the more viscous it would be. That's not always the case. Mercury is really, really dense, but it's not very viscous at all. So viscosity is, is there are a few ways you can measure it. Um, one of which is basically if you make a hole in the bottom of a container, how fast does the liquid flow through that hole? Um, there's also an experiment called a pitch drop experiment um, where it's basically like, okay, if you, if you have a, like a dropper full, how long does it take the drop to fall? Um, and there's actually, there's an ongoing um, pitch drop experiment. They, they call it the pitch drop experiment because one of the first things they tried to test with this was pine tar, different saps, um, because sap is a really viscous liquid, right? And so there's actually an, a pitch drop experiment that's been going on for better than 40 years, I think, where they've been waiting for a drop of pitch to fall from this apparatus um, for decades. It might even be, it might, it might be approaching a hundred years now that I think about it. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a there's one that's ongoing that has had multiple drops happen. They just keep it going and they yeah, and from knowing the the predict the difference in time between the first two drops was enough that they can predict the rest of them um to a lot of sig figs actually. Um but yeah, if you if you look at that, if you look up pitch drop experiment, there's a lot of of kind of weird environmental science or botany applications of it. But that is one way of measuring viscosity. Um, what's going at a at a molecular level? What's going to make something more viscous? What type of intermolecular force is stronger or weaker? Stronger, weaker? I have two opposite answers to a fifty-fifty question. So, what's your logic, Josie? If, if you have more attractive forces between the molecules, then to break, you're almost physically breaking off a chunk of it to make a droplet, right? And if you have stronger forces between the molecules, it kind of makes sense that it would be, that you would have to work harder to make a droplet form. Somebody have want to walk through the logic for why you might say weaker intermolecular forces would be more viscous? Or is that just stab in the dark? That's fine too. It was a 50-50 shot. You had pretty good luck. Um, yeah, it is. As stronger intermolecular forces mean, means more viscous usually. I think I can say always, I just always balk at, at using absolutes. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. Um, what would happen if you increase the temperature? Would the viscosity go up or down? Would things get more viscous or less viscous? Less viscous, why? If all of the molecules are moving faster and have more kinetic energy, they're gonna hold on to each other less. There's a greater, think back to our ping pong, our box full of ping pong balls, right? If I shake it more, there's a greater chance that one of those ping pong balls flies out, right? There's, you can think of a ping pong ball flying out of that box as um, forming a droplet. It's easier to form a droplet or break those bonds if everything is moving faster. And you can see this with maple syrup. Maple syrup is a great example of viscosity. If you warm up maple syrup, it's a lot more liquidy, right? Less syrupy. At some certain point it crystallizes, but then we have phase change happening and phase changes make everything more complicated we're finding, right? Um, all 
All right. So is does uh, a change in molecular weight affect thing affect viscosity? What is changing molecular weight? Changing number of hydrogen bonds. We kind of understand that, right? For if you had, um, does anybody work on cars at all here? We have similar sized molecules, but one of them can make more molecular or intermolecular bonds than another. Which of these would we expect to be more viscous? More hydrogen bonds, stronger intermolecular forces means more viscous. This is um, antifreeze. Has anybody ever put antifreeze in a car before? It's pretty gloopy, right? It's pretty viscous. This is drinking alcohol. Drinking alcohol is not very viscous at all. In fact, it's less viscous than water is. Yeah, but the same, almost the same exact molecule, except this one has an extra OH group and it's really, really gloopy. Really a lot more viscous. Um, another one, if you take this, if you extend it out another carbon and add another OH group, that's glycerin. Glycerin is exceptionally viscous. It makes really, really good bubbles. If you wanted to blow like the best bubbles, you could make your own bubble fluid um, and you would use like dish soap and some glycerin mixed together, make really, really good bubble juice. Uh, because it's so viscous, it has really strong intermolecular forces. So what about, what changes if you just change the size of the molecule? If you just increased the molecular weight, how does that affect intermolecular forces? Anybody remember how we described that? Or what type of forces are changing? Let's say if we had just ethane versus butane. They're both totally nonpolar, so no hydrogen bonds to worry about. What type of intermolecular forces are present in these molecules? Does it have any ion dipole attractions? Does it have any hydrogen bonds? Well, it has carbon hydrogen bonds, but not hydrogen bonds like the intermolecular force because it doesn't have any oxygens, nitrogens, fluorines, or chlorines. Does it have, are these polar molecules? If they're non-polar molecules, you can't have any dipole-dipole attractions at all. So what's the only other type of force left? Dispersion forces. Those are the ones that are always present no matter what, right? Those are the ones that are based on just electrons randomly moving around, can create those temporary dipoles. If we have more electrons, does that make the molecule have stronger dispersion forces or weaker dispersion forces? More electrons means more attractive forces. More attractive forces means more viscosity. Also means higher boiling point, higher melting point. All of those things are tied to intermolecular forces, right? If the only intermolecular forces we have are dispersion forces, the bigger molecule is going to be more viscous. There's a little bit more to it than that when we start looking at thing at organic molecules like saturated fats versus unsaturated fats can be the same size but have different melting points. Um, but that's that's based on the shape of the molecule. And when you take OCHEM, we'll get into that. All right, a couple more couple more uh, properties of liquids that we'll talk about that are all going to come back to the same thing, those intermolecular forces. 
one of which is surface tension. If things are more viscous, would we expect them to have more surface tension? Yeah, in general, surface tension is caused by the fact that if you have a whole bunch of attractive forces on all the molecules in the middle, but you only have attractive forces on geometrically on half of the ones that are on a surface, those molecules that are on a surface have a net pull inward. There's nothing, this molecule in the middle, it's being pulled in all three dimensions equally, right? By those intermolecular, on average. But a molecule that's on the surface is being pulled down more than it's being pulled up because there's no attractive forces with the air above it, right? So intermolecular forces are 100% responsible for surface tension. And the stronger the intermolecular forces, the more surface tension you have. Um, and surface tension also has its own units. These ones are really weird. Joules per square meter. What is a joule per square meter? Anybody guess what that means? How would they measure joules per square meter? Yeah, it's basically if you increase the surface area, you're going to have to put some energy into it. The amount of energy to increase the surface area by one square meter is how they rate surface tension. So everybody's seen, seen pictures of water droplets falling. They, look, they don't look droplet shaped, right? They look like a sphere. Everybody's seen pictures of, of uh, water in, on the International Space Station. Just looks like a globe, right? That's because spheres minimize surface area relative to the volume. The lowest surface area you can have for a given volume is going to be a sphere. If you want to take that and spread it out to a different shape, you have to put energy into it. You have to overcome the surface tension to do that. Uh, and that's why different liquids behave differently and have different surface tensions too. It's because they have different intermolecular forces. Stronger intermolecular forces, more surface tension. Also applies to stuff like maple syrup, right? Um, it might make a bit of a mess, so I'd recommend doing this on like a cookie sheet. But if you tried to like fill up a, a water glass with water all the way as high as you could get, get the meniscus to form over the top, right? If you did the same thing with maple syrup, you should be able to get it to extend further before that breaks that surface tension and flows over the side. Again, do it on, on a cookie sheet. The parent in me says, please, please do it on, on the cookie sheet. All right, one more vocab term, cohesive versus adhesive. What does cohesive mean? What does cohesive mean in everyday language? If we say that something is cohesive, it sticks together, it goes together, it matches, right? So a cohesive force is the intermolecular forces that pull a condensed phase inward towards itself. Adhesive forces, what is the adhesive in everyday life? Sticky. sticky. Anything sticky is adhesive, right? Glue is an adhesive. Tape is an adhesive. Adhesive means that you're binding something to something else, to a different material. Um, and cohesive forces versus adhesive forces are what are responsible for the meniscus shape on a molecule. If you have a meniscus... If we have water in a graduated cylinder and the meniscus looks like this, there are some adhesive forces holding the molecules to each other, but, or sorry, co some cohesive forces, but there's also pretty strong adhesive forces. That's what makes the water climb up the sides like that. If the cohesive forces are much stronger, then the adhesive forces, you actually get a reverse meniscus. If the molecules and the atoms are being attracted to 
each other much more, much more strongly than they're being attracted to the walls of the container, you get a meniscus that looks like this, which is what we see with, with mercury. So you can't really tell from this figure very well, but if you put mercury or any liquid metal into glass, it doesn't actually form um, a meniscus like this. It forms a the convex meniscus, which is a little weird, but it kind of makes sense in, in the terms of adhesive versus cohesive forces. Um, there was something I was going to say about that. Oh, if we're trying to measure a liquid, how do we measure how do we measure these two the bottom of the meniscus on this one so 5.1 or so 5.2 what about when it looks like this and so it's not we don't really think the the most clear way to say is it's not the bottom of the meniscus, it's the flattest part of the meniscus. So in this case, it would be that part. Almost 99.9% .9 of the time, it's the bottom of the meniscus. But every once in a while, you'll get a liquid or in a container um, where you get something like this and you actually have to measure it from the top of the meniscus. The flattest part of the meniscus is the universal way to say it. All right. Questions about these random vocabulary terms, applications, they all kind of come back to intermolecular forces. So for the most part, the way that I test on this section is, can you describe the intermolecular forces and rank them? And then do the same thing. Which of these liquids would you expect to be most viscous and least viscous or have the highest boiling point, lowest boiling point? What's the surface tension of something running or especially? That gets tricky because non-Newtonian fluids, um, rate the speed at which you're causing them to expand is comes into play. Uh, it does not have a very high surface tension when it's moving slowly. It has a very high surface tension if you're asking it to move quickly. Because for most things, for Newtonian fluids, the faster you apply a force, the faster they move. But cornstarch in water is the opposite. The faster you apply a force, the slower it moves, the more it resists being moved. And so it kind of throws things on its head a little bit because it brings time into it. None of the things we're dealing with so far have time involved at all. Um, so fun to play with, really, really great project for your physics class research project um, in terms of trying to describe it mathematically, but beyond what we're gonna do here. All right. Did we talk about heating curves in here yet? How temperature changes versus... Good, so we talked about how if we had a sample of water and at say minus 10 Celsius and we put energy in, what's gonna happen? If you add energy to a piece of solid water at minus 10 Celsius, what's going to happen? Temperature is going to increase until what? Until you get the phase change. At which point it stays constant. What happens when all the ice is melted? Temperature starts going up again once it's all liquid, right? Until you get to 
boiling point. At which point temperature evens out again. So now we actually have, this is something we've talked about before. We talked about energy and we talked about this to some extent. The energy of the phase change though, when we talked about before, we did it in joules per gram of a substance. That's kind of a non-standard way of looking at it though. Now that we have the right terms, we're gonna do it. Most of the time you're gonna see the energy of these phase changes reported in joules per mole, not joules per gram or kilojoules per mole more, more likely. It doesn't really change answering any of these questions. If I say, how, what's the total amount of energy to go from a piece of ice at minus 10 Celsius to steam at 110 Celsius? It's still gonna go through the same processes that we did before. When we have a temperature change, what equation do we use? What's the equation for temperature change and heat? Q equals M C P delta T. So for any of these steps where you have a temperature change happening, one, three, and five, you would just use this. Any phase changes, two and four, you're gonna use delta H of fusion, or for four, you'd use delta H of vaporization. And just watch the units. The units will tell you whether or not you're supposed to use the mass or moles for these ones, but usually we're gonna do it in moles. All right, is there anything else? All right, last thing. Let's just do a little vocab review. We'll end a few minutes early today and you can ask some questions on the assignment or work on it or sit around and wait for the bell. Uh, but first, sections A, B, and C on this chart. How would we label those? What type, is it a phase change? Is it a phase? Is it an energy? Is it a temperature? What are the different regions of this graph representing? Phases. So pressure, temperature. So what is this section? What phase is this section? Solid. This liquid, which makes this gas. You remember the general shape, you can always logic your way back to which one is which, right? Especially if you can remember what this is, right? You know that these two, one of them has to be liquid, one of them has to be a gas because this is where you got that super critical fluid, right? That critical point. What is this point called? Triple point, and I already said it, but that's our critical point. So going to to the uh, arrows here, what phase change is happening for E, for letter E? Starting is a solid moving into a liquid, which is melting. Yeah. What about D, from a gas to a solid? Deposition. What's the opposite of deposition? Sublimation. Going from our uh, arrow H, I think we all understand how these more common ones work, right? H would be condensation. I would be 
evaporate evaporation or vaporization you can say evaporation you can say vaporization you can't say vaporization um is there a phase change associated with that arrow kind of it's different before and after but it's not real it doesn't go through a phase change that has a hard line like the rest of these do it's behaving once you get above the critical point you can say it's behaving as a supercritical fluid but that's not like it stops and goes through a phase change like our other phase changes do this is definitely more of a gradient which is why it's not a whole separate phase um, and you can see more complicated phase diagrams too, because not everything is going to have the same. In fact, I think your assignment has a couple more complicated ones. Um, for substances where you have different crystal structures that you can form, you get different solid phases. You can have a phase change between um, two different types of ice or between graphite and diamond. Graphite and diamond are both carbon, right? They're both solid forms of carbon. They actually have their own sections on the phase change, on the phase diagram. If you increase the pressure, you can get a, a graph piece of graphite to turn into a diamond. Everybody's heard that before, right? Um, it actually is true. And what's happening is this solid chunk is broken up into smaller subsections. There's about, there's about 11 different crystalline forms of ice. Ice is act, water actually has a very complicated phase diagram, especially when you get to really high pressures um, because you get other forms of ice, which is where that Kurt Vonnegut book, Cat's Cradle, gets the term ice nine. There actually is an ice nine. It just doesn't behave the way it does in the sci-fi book. Um, but on say Jupiter or I think it's Neptune that's mostly made out of water. Um, it has different forms of ice present because it has extremely high pressures at the center of, of a gas giant. And so it gets some of those, they call them exotic phases. Um, and there's also things like Bose-Einstein condensates and, and superconducting phases and things like that too. This is just getting you started for what a phase diagram is, but then you expand those same concepts to more complicated phases as you get further into material science. All right, we did it. Good job. We get to talk about radioactivity on Friday. Or your assignment for tomorrow, if we're still hung up on some things from, from that assignment too. Likely a mixture of the two of them. I don't know.